Did we have an amazing week? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it was a tough week, maybe it was a great week, but uh, it was a lesson. There's always lessons to be learned. Amen to that. Well, we're getting ready to worship the Lord together. Are you guys ready for that? Okay. Well, let's ask the Lord to, uh, to come and be with us today and amongst us. Heavenly Father, we ask that you come now in the power of your Holy Spirit. Remind us of what you've done and who you are. You're worthy of our praise. Lord God, you are worthy of the songs that we sing. God, as we lift our hearts to you, we ask that you minister to us. We ask that you remind us. Remind us of the power that it took to redeem us. Remind us of the joy that is ours in Christ Jesus. Remind us that we are precious to you. God, your word tells us that we are the apple of your eye. Each and every one of us is your favorite. What a joy to be known as the favorite of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Thank you, God, that you made a way for us to be here today and worship you. Heavenly Father, we lay down our defenses. They're useless against the power of your love. Come and wash over us. Come and refresh us. From the tops of our heads to the soles of our feet, Lord Jesus, we ask you. And we thank you. We thank you that it is so. Father, as we worship you today, as we hear your words spoken and truth revealed, that we would receive it with gladness. God, I pray that each and every one of us can apply what we learned today. Thank you that you're calling us higher. Thank you that you're calling us to so much more than we could ever dream or imagine or even ask for, God. Thank you that you are Abba. And that we can trust you with every aspect of our life. Moment by moment, God, help us to seek after you. Help us to know that you truly are the way, the truth, and the life. And help us to bask in the light of your glory, enjoying fellowship with you and with one another. This is our prayer this morning, Father God. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray and ask these things. Amen. Well, will you stand with us this morning as we worship?
sing together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only name that could ever say.
ask you, fill us. Fill us that way, Jesus. loving us for living and dying so that we could be free living and loving so that we would learn how to be Father God it's only through your love and only through your grace that we could ever hope to be anything like your son so we thank you we thank you now that you richly and lavishly pour your love out upon us you shed it abroad in our hearts so that we can know what it means to be loved by the God of the universe. All-powerful, 
all-knowing. You see every part of us, God, and you, you don't turn us away. But you draw us in, God. Nothing stands in the way when you are on the move. So God, we ask that you move in our hearts today. Speak to us. Remind us of how loved we are through your son, Jesus, and in his name and for his sake. Amen. Please be seated, family. All right, so we have just a, a few announcements this morning. Um, our lovely arrangement is to the glory of God and in honor of Heidi Smith, that is Larry and Sandy's daughter. It is August 1st, so where are my August babies? And I'll raise my hand with you. Yeah, three, four, five, okay. And I'm sure we have some friends online that are watching that it's also their birthday. So if you're new with us, and you, we sing happy birthday, we sing God bless you instead of their name. So will you sing happy birthday with me? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. Yes, may God bless you richly in this new year as you come to know him more. There's one thing that we have been neglecting to do, and I apologize for that. Is anybody celebrating an anniversary this month? Do we have any lovebirds who have an anniversary in August? You just had one. There we go. Bruce and Barb are celebrating their anniversary. Well, good for you guys, and God bless you. Um, it is uh, the a new month, and uh, our Women's devotional and uh, opportunity for prayer and soul care is happening at Classics at 9 a.m. on the second Tuesday. That is the 10th of August. So if you have time in your schedule, come down to Classics and enjoy a cup of coffee maybe and even some breakfast if you're hungry and, uh, and enjoy time in the Word with the women of the church. That is a, a, a women's ministry. Wednesday night fellowship this week at 6.30. We're continuing our journey through The Chosen, Season 2, Episode 3. And um, it's going to be fantastic. We had a blast uh, last week. Really enjoyed the fellowship afterwards as we explored uh, what it meant to uh, be seen by God, even when we don't think that He can see us. In the midst of our trouble, in the midst of our sorrow, our God is aware of us and cares for us. And, uh, and this week, I'm sure, will be just as enlightening and it's just as enjoyable our tithes and our offerings are behind us in the back corner of the room on your way out um, and all of these gifts go to uh, the mission of the church and to take care of the things that we need to and if you would like to uh, to text to give if you're watching online with us this would be the easiest way for you to share your gifts with us if you text give to 660-628-3001 it'll send you a prompt and you will be just a few clicks away from being able to share your gifts electronically. And, uh, and, and those gifts also go to the mission of this church. So we're breaching the, the technical gap here, and, um, and it works out really easily, and, uh, and it's really fun. And, and more is to come through this uh, Simple Give is the name of the company that we use. And, uh, and, and I just had a talk with them, and, and there's an amazing platform, and we're going to be able to communicate with everyone uh, via, via text through this easy, free app on your phone. You can give from the app as well, and, uh, and there'll just be a whole lot of, of good things coming out of that. And uh, which reminds me, if you are techie, if you are uh, someone who likes to explore websites and find out how they work, please come and talk to me because there's a whole lot of opportunities that can be explored in Simple Give, and it would be wonderful that, uh, to get some help from the congregation in any way. If, if any of you have time to do that and explore that, that would be awesome. Let's talk, and we can set you up with special permissions, and don't worry, we can set it up in a safe way that you won't ever be involved in any of the money or anything like that. It's just an opportunity to reach out and to continue um, with our mission here at Cole Camp UMC. Uh, prayer requests this week have been coming in, and uh, we're going to be praying for Carson, Stephen, and Stevie, 
Um, on September 14th, Carson and Stevie are hoping, hoping to adopt, and, uh, and they, are, uh, they are friends of Johnny's, and so we're asking uh, for the Lord to have his way and his will in this, um, this situation. They're foster parents, and so they're hoping uh, for, for the adoption on the 14th of September. Um, I re- received a, a message um, from uh, Brenda Vansel this morning, and uh, she's asking us to lift up the Boyer family, uh, their son Dennis, uh, passed away in an unfortunate accident this weekend, and uh, and so they're laying him to rest this morning. And uh, he was an organ donor, so a beautiful way for him to uh, to share uh, his organs with other people that need them. So uh, he gets to to live on, in the words of uh, Brenda Vansel. So um, we're going to be praying uh, for uh, for the Boyer family this morning. Anyone else have a prayer request they would like to raise before God? Yes, Johnny. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Well, then let's uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we uh, we come before you now and. God, we ask that, uh, that you would provide such a perfect place for little Stevie. God, we ask that you would, um, you would minister to the boy or family. God, parents shouldn't have to bury their children. So God, I pray for a special blessing of grace and hope to so fill that family this morning. God, I ask that and we pray that that he knew you, Lord. That he surrendered his life to you. We ask for your mercy. Thank you that you are the God of all comfort and that you will comfort this family. God, we ask that you provide for Danette as she looks for a place here in Cole Camp. God, we ask that you would minister to us as we seek after you in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, kiddos, why don't you guys come on up? I've got a, a lesson for you. And why don't you all sit up here, and I'll sit down here so that all of our online friends can can enjoy seeing what I see. All right. Well, I learned something really cool this week, and and, and I want to share it with you guys. Have you guys ever been in a situation where you're really scared? Yeah? Yeah. Do you ever get that weird feeling in your stomach? Like, you're not really sure what's going to happen. You're like, oh, yeah. Well, did you guys know that your bodies do that on purpose? They do. Did you know that animals get that same feeling when they're in danger? And, and what, what we call that feeling is the flight or fight response. Some of us, when we get those feelings, we don't run away. We get ready for whatever it's going to be right? Animals, on the other hand, they feel that feeling, like say it's an impala, and it knows that the lion is coming after it. It takes off running, and that th- those chemicals in their bodies help them to run faster and to think faster, and it only lasts for a little while. Do you know why? Because they either get away or they're lunch, Right? Now, in humans, did you know that we're the only people that make up reasons to feel that way? Now, you guys are young, so you might not know what I'm talking about, but you're going to grow up, and, it, and this just might help you. Jesus told us, don't worry. You know why? It accomplishes absolutely nothing. 
Jesus said, you can't worry yourself taller, can you? If you were worried about being short, you couldn't worry about it so long that all of a sudden you just kind of grow up another little bit, you know? It's not going to happen. But what it's going to do on the inside of your body is it's going to wear you down. Your, your immune system is going to work so hard to keep you feeling this way that it can't fight off infection. And, and then you're going to age faster, all of those things, and you'll be tired more often, and you can get sicknesses in your body because you're so worried about stuff. Anybody worry a lot about things yet? Do you? Okay. So, and, and, and okay, but a lot of that is learned behavior. If you know people that talk about worry a lot, it'll make you worry a lot. And so Jesus is trying to help us to understand that you can't worry a situation away. You can't worry something into being. If you were really worried about getting a toy and you didn't get it, you couldn't worry some more and get it, right? Yeah. And so starting right now, when we feel those feelings inside of us and we don't have a reason to run away or to protect ourselves, we need to ask Jesus to remind us of his peace. Because only in his peace will those feelings subside. And wouldn't it be nice that whenever you feel those feelings come up, you just say, Jesus, thank you for your peace. I receive it now in your name. And for all of those feelings to just drop and go away. That's possible. It's possible for us to not worry and not to feel those feelings inside of us. But it takes faith. You have to believe that Jesus really can help you not worry. I promise that I'm not just saying weird stuff up here just to fill your heads. This is real. Jesus told us not to worry. And so we have to be obedient to the Lord. And when we do start to worry, we just need to ask him to help us not to. So can we ask the Lord to help us in our daily life when our mind starts thinking about stuff that hasn't even happened and we start to worry, to ask Jesus to calm us. Let's do that, okay? Let's ask Jesus. Jesus, we thank you right now for the truth of your word and that you sat there on that hilltop and you told thousands of people, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. Don't worry. So Lord, I ask that you help us. Help us all to trust you more, and to worry less. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, kiddos. All right. Well, this morning, as we dive back into our study of 1 Peter 4, we're going to be looking at being a good steward of God's grace. Peter says this to us. We read it last week and we'll read it again in context. 1 Peter 7 through 11. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be serious and discipline yourselves for the sake of your prayers. Above all, maintain constant or fervent love for one another. For love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. Whoever speaks must do so as one speaking the very words of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. To him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. I'd really like for us to get a good hard look at what Peter is trying to get us to understand. Last week we remembered that 
he's teaching us about a vertical relationship, right? We need to be serious about our prayer life. We need to be serious about the way that we engage the living God. And we need to be very aware of how we deal with one another, okay? And so this relationship that Peter is teaching us is so vital to Christian living. All of what Peter is talking about is a lesson in Christian living. If you don't have anything else but the book of Peter, 1 Peter, you'll be set. The gospel is clearly stated. And what he's trying to help us to see is that we need to be living fruitful Christian lives. Not lives in which we say, hey, I'm a Christian and I go to church. I believe. I've seen shirts that say that. Only believe. Y'all ever seen those shirts? Only believe. That is a surefire way to slip somebody in to a false sense of security. Because the word also tells us that Satan believes and trembles. If we only believe and we're cool with that, we're missing something. We're missing something. Jesus is calling us to fruitful living. Fruitful living. Now, if you say, I do believe, and, and, and God is at work in my life and I see it, I would say, amen. Amen to that, because fruit comes from a life filled with the Spirit. The Spirit is engaging us through the text this morning. He is engaging us in our hearts this morning as we look at ourselves. These are wonderful times for self-examination. We really need to look at what is happening in our life. Are we producing fruit that is consistent with what the gospel is telling us a Christian life is full of? Or are we lacking fruit? Now, I'm not telling us to go out and be fruit inspectors and look at everybody and find out whether they are a Christian or they're not a Christian. That's not for us. But it is obvious when the Spirit of God is at work in the life of a believer. Things change. Life is different. And unfortunately, in, in our time, we can get very caught up in our own opinions, our own interpretation of what the Bible means, instead of what it actually says. And before we know it, we don't even believe the Bible or parts of the Bible. The Word of God, I've said it before and I'll say it again, is timeless. It is 100% without error. And so, when we come to grips with that truth, it will change the way that we look and deal with situations in our life. We'll stop excusing certain behaviors. We'll stop making reasons why it's okay to feel the way that I feel. Our feelings will lie to us. And a great, a great verse that reminds us of this is from Galatians 6, 7. Paul tells us, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Now, what does that have to do with being a good Christian steward of the grace of God that's been given to us? Well, if we have any sort of contention or preconceived notion against the word of God, regardless of the subject, then, then we have been deceived. If we set up belief systems in our heart based on experience or feelings or worse, what we think that are contrary to written scripture, we are deceived. If we think for a moment because of how we feel or what someone else has said that scripture is some way incorrect, we are greatly deceived. And so I ask this question to us this morning. Would Almighty God put His character on display 
his ordinances and his mandates for his people in written format for all the world to see while sitting up on his throne going, ooh, I'm going to have some explaining to do at the end of all of this. I would say that we would be greatly deceived if we were to think that. Now, we can truly misunderstand Scripture. It happens. It happens. And that's why in Proverbs 4, we see these words. Get wisdom. Get understanding. Do not forget my words or swerve from them. Do not forsake wisdom. And she will watch over you. Wisdom is supreme. Therefore, get wisdom. Though it costs you all you have, get understanding. So this morning, let's ask the Lord to give us understanding of the text as we read it together and and enjoy the goodness found therein. Because I know that for a Christian, our life goal is to love him and know him more and more. Never to be satisfied with what we learned yesterday, but what we want to know today. It's a constant grasping for understanding and learning that God is seeking for us to attain. Peter reminded us last week that the end is near. Time is short. Jesus says... I am coming soon. He said that 2,000 years ago, which means that we're closer now to him coming back than they were, which means that there isn't much time left. Paul told us to redeem the time. Paul told us to get everything out of it that we can. So we said last week that we need to be alert We need to be sober-minded. That's an idea of having a saved mind. The mind of Christ. It's the only thing that's going to get us through. It's the only thing that's going to bring us together. So as we think about Christian service, we see in these verses... Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. Isn't this great? Each of us, each of us in Christ receive a spiritual gift. There's five places in the Bible that talk about spiritual gifts. There's only a couple places where they're going to be duplicated, sometimes never duplicated. But what's really great about that is that there's a different gift for each of us that's manifested so uniquely within us because all of us are different. You can get five teachers together and give them the same lesson and they will teach it differently, won't they? You tell an artist or two to paint a picture of the same thing, it's going to look different. You can give pastors the same scripture and each of them are going to teach it differently. But we do it differently and uniquely because all of us are uniquely created. And because of our experience, because of what we've done and what we know, we use these gifts in special ways. And God is telling us that we've all received this spiritual gift and we need to use it for one another. It's not our own gift. It, it, it doesn't do us any good to be selfish with the gift that God has given us because then it is running completely contrary to what redeemed faith looks like. And the only way that we're going to be able to use these spiritual gifts is through faith. So I want to talk a little bit this morning about faith. And what's so beautiful is that I found a really great quote by Martin Luther, a great reformer of the church. I'm not trying to make anybody Lutheran, I promise. 
but Martin Luther was a wonderful man of God, and, and, and his words are true. He says this, Oh, this faith is a living, busy, active, powerful thing. It is impossible that it should not be ceaselessly doing that which is good. It does not even ask whether good should be done, but before the question can be asked, it has done them. But he who does not do such works is a man without faith. He gropes and casts about him and fi to find faith in good works, not knowing what either of them is, and yet prattles and idly multiplies words, but faith and good works. Further, he says, faith is a living, well-founded confidence in the grace of God, so perfectly certain that it would die a thousand times rather than surrender its conviction. Such confidence and personal knowledge of divine grace makes its possessor joyful, bold, full of warm affection toward God and all created things, all of which the Holy Spirit works in faith. Hence, such a man becomes without constraint, willing, and eager to do to everyone, to serve everyone, and suffer all manner of ills in order to please and glorify God, who has shown toward him such grace. End quote. Now, certainly charged with this kind of faith is, is impressive and it's encouraging. If, if God is trying to get us to engage in a faith like this that is ceaselessly working toward kingdom goals, ceaselessly, ce uh, ceaselessly in enjoying the joy and peace found within, then we can very well be encouraged by the words of Peter, who is speaking to an oppressed church, who is speaking to alienated believers, speaking to people who would have to leave one area because of persecution and go to another city and there find help from fellow believers. Could you imagine how awful it would be if you were displaced from your home because of your faith, go to another town, go to a church or to a home of a, of a known believer and say, I really need your help. I really need your help. I, I, I need some food. We don't have any food. And they just roll their eyes at you or they haughtily get a bag ready for you and hand it to you and send you on your way. Or even worse, they do let you in. And then late at night, you hear them speaking of how much of an inconvenience you are to their way of life. That's so incongruent with gospel living. It's so counter what Jesus is asking of us and who he's calling us to be. when we see that we're supposed to be stewards, stewards of this grace, someone who's charged with taking care of something. Do you remember the, the, the uh, story that we talked about last week of, of the wicked servant who had been given that talent and instead of working it and growing it, he just buried it. He did nothing with this gift that was given to him by the master. It didn't go well for him. It didn't go well for him, and, and Peter is trying to help us to understand that this isn't good to withhold the gifts that God has given us from the body because, one, it's a defiance against God who has graciously equipped you for that very service, and, two, it hurts the body. It hurts the body. Paul elaborates on the body in 1 Corinthians 12 and talks about how all of us are built together like a body, and some of us are an eye, and some of us are an ear. Some of us are internal parts, the parts that get the least amount of glory. No one sees them. And it's funny, I heard a pastor this week talk about how nowadays everyone's doing things to change their face, or their hands, or, or their feet, or their, their hips, or their abs, or whatever you want to call it. That we're always trying to change the outside of the body. When back in the day, the last thing we wanted to do was change the outside of the body. We wanted to make sure the inside was okay. 
if we spend so much time worrying about the outside appearance, if we as Christians try to maintain simply an outward look, looking good like a good Christian on the outside and aren't doing anything on the inside to further the kingdom of God, we're kind of caught right there where the Pharisees were. They look good on the outside, but on the inside, they're just full of dead men's bones. We don't want to be that kind of Christian. We want to be a Christian who's moved by the love of God to action. And what's really great is that each and every one of us has been given a beautiful gift, and it's so distinct to you. Only you can do that. These spiritual gifts, over time, we have tried to devise methods to single them out and to perhaps analyze our behavior to find out what they are. And it's not how that works. Because it is so unique. It is so unique. It's great we get the, the picture of a, of, a, of a palette of an artist. And because you are unique, God takes your uniqueness and he places his spirit within you which allows this gift in you to flourish in such a way that only you could do it. And when you hold it from the body, it's like walking around without a leg. We're not going to get very far. We're going to have a hard time accomplishing our mission. The uniqueness of that gift, what's funny, is in the, in the Greek, that word is idios, where we get the word idiot. Isn't that funny? We're all a bunch of creative idiots. Not in a bad way. It just... It just means peculiar. We've taken that word idiot and turned it into something nasty. But it strictly really means just peculiar or different. We're like uh, John MacArthur calls us snowflakes. We're spiritual snowflakes. Each one of us is different. We're all different. Peter goes on and, and tells us that Whoever speaks must do so as one speaking the very words of God. This is very important because some of us have received speaking gifts. Some of us have received serving gifts. Helping gifts. But when we are called on to employ a gift, and it is the gift of preaching or teaching, then we must make sure that we are speaking the words of God now, that doesn't mean that every single word that I say is from, from God because only His Scripture, the Scriptures are the Word of God. But when we elaborate on those things, we must be elaborating on them from the Word of God in the manner in which brings the most truth. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. The first thing that's going to keep us from glorifying God in our service is us. If we get in the way, if we start working these things so that we will look like we're doing good, like, like we're, we're, we're doing our share, where's everybody else at? Then we are going to be going contrary because that's a form of grumbling. We want to work so that God will be glorified, so that God gets all the glory through Jesus Christ, and he finishes with a doxology, to him belong the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. May it be so. Our lives, like we sang this morning, are to be lived to the glory of God. When we work, we work toward the glory of God, so that his name is professed first, it's not about us anymore. It's a dying to self and knowing that in the lack of us, Jesus will fill in the rest. Jesus wants to work through us. He's given each of us something very special to give the church. Let's use it. Let's use it for the glory and for the dominion of the kingdom because God deserves all of our service. He deserves every part of us because He gave His all so that we could learn what it means to live for Him. Today we celebrate the breaking of bread. 
And today, we remember that on the night that he was handed over to suffering and death, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to them. And he said, eat this, all of you. This is my body. And it was broken for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you eat it, do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And after he had given thanks, he blessed it and said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this, all of you. And as often as you drink this, do it in remembrance of me. So it is our joy now to partake in the Lord's Supper. If you're visiting here, we take the bread and we dip it in the cup. If you're not comfortable with that, we have individual packets here for you as well. So please come as you feel led to the Lord's table. All are welcome.
we prepare to go, let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the gifts that you have so richly blessed us with. We thank you for the gift of your Son, who through him we receive eternal life. The forgiveness of sin, life everlasting. A new way of being, God. Help us to embrace this truth. Help us to live our lives for you. Help us to grow in whatever gift it is that you have given us to encourage the body of Christ and to support it. Lord Jesus, all of these things are possible because of your sacrifice. Because you made a way. So God, I, I pray that this morning we would leave this place with an assurance that we have been made for a purpose and that we are necessary within the fabric of this community, within the fabric of this church. God, as Peter put it, we are living stones stacked upon each other to build a spiritual, spiritual temple. all to your glory, Lord. And it is to your glory, Jesus, that we pray the prayer that you've taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would you please stand as we go with this blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, beloved.